Jehovah Nisi. What does it mean? Anyone? She didn't say that. <laughs> Any other person? Jehovah Nisi. I didn't hear. The Lord Abana. Thank you. Any other person? So it's it, it means the Lord our banner or the Lord our refuge. Right? And this one, I want to spend some time to look at where that name came from, the situation surrounding that name, and how it applies to us. Right? Are we ready? Let's go to Exodus chapter number 17. Exodus chapter number 17. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to read from verse number 8. Exodus chapter number 17. And I'd like to read from verse number 8. Now, Jehovah Nisi was a revelation they had at a time of warfare. So God revealed himself to them, to his people, at a time of warfare. Now, look at what he says from verse number 8. Now, Amalek came and fought with Israel in rapid. Now, I want us to note something. If you're using your Bible, please take note of that. Because we need to, to, for us to understand the name Jehovah Nisi, we need to understand who Amalek was. Does anybody know who Amalek was? Amalek, the Amalekites. Don't say. Okay, the en- of of course they were the enemies of the Israelites. Okay. Okay. Yes, please. You know the funny thing is we have a lot of students here, and I've asked you a simple question. You are just dancing around the whole thing. If I were to score you, you will say they gave me F9. All right, let, let, let's, let's go straight, right? Now, if you read through the Old Testament, you would encounter that name, Amalek, Amalekites, right? And it's important that we understand who they were. Because here, in chapter number 17 from verse 8, the Bible says, now this was when water came out of the rock. The children of Israel had left Egypt. They had experienced so many miraculous things from God. They had experienced the manna from God. They had walked on dry land. They had seen so many things. Water came out from the rock. And out of nowhere, the Bible says in verse number 8, now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. That would suggest that there was not, it was an unprovoked attack. But it is interesting because if we understand who they were, then perhaps we might begin to appreciate the name the Lord Nisi. Amalek was the first cousins of the children of Israel. So they were not strangers. 
they were actually the first cousins of the children of Israel. Now, that may sound strange because why would your own blood attack you? When you read further down in 1st and 2nd Samuel, when God instructed Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites, right? And he kept, he, he kept, he, he kept him alive and kept some of the, what he thought was the good items. And he lost the kingdom because of that. There is something about understanding what God says to destroy and obeying because you see when we keep alive what God says for us to destroy it comes back to destroy us now Amalek here represents so Amalek The flesh. And I know we're going to look at the story and it was a warfare. But I want us to look at how it applies to us as believers. Because it represents the flesh. And the ultimate goal of the flesh for any believer is it will stifle it will destroy your walk of faith. So when God says to destroy them utterly, there was a reason for that. Because there was always going to be a war against the spirit and the flesh. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you don't need to do anything to provoke the flesh. Because the children of Israel, the Bible says, they just came out and they were attacked. Look at what he says. Verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Repidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose or some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Now, I want us to know that he did not say go and negotiate with them. Try to be accommodating to them. Because we do not negotiate with the flesh. We subdue the flesh. A lot of believers have found themselves in difficult situations because we have not tamed our flesh. You may have experienced a lot of great things from God. But you see that flesh, Paul tells us we die daily. And unless we are deceiving ourselves, we know some of us have found ourselves in situations where we've said to ourselves, oh, I'm in control, don't worry. I'm, I'm in charge, don't worry. But then, you know you're not in charge afterwards because you're asking for forgiveness. Some of us have done things like, Father Lord, if, if I ever do this thing again, kill me. And you're glad God did not answer that prayer. Because you did it many times. You see, the number one enemy of a Christian is not your next door neighbor. I know we've been groomed to think it is that old witch. It is that wicked colleague. Our number one enemy is not even your spouse. For the married people, say, this woman, this man. Ah, I made a mistake. Every time I want to fast, 
should just carry. They will just, no. Our number one enemy is the flesh. And for the children of Israel, it was Amalek. And unless we learn to tame the flesh, he didn't say, let us go and negotiate with them. We're going to war. Look at Genesis chapter number 36. Let me show you something. We'll come to Exodus. Let's just see how they came to be. Genesis chapter 36. I want to read from verse number nine. We know the story of Esau and who? Jacob. The Bible says here, just because of time, from verse nine, he says, and this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. These were the names of Esau's son. So the Bible is telling us the names of the sons of Esau. Remember, Jacob is the father, as it were, of the children of Israel because he came from that village anyway. Now, Esau... The Bible tells us his own sons. It says, these were the names of Esau's son. Eliphaz, the son of Adi, is the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. Now, Esau had two sons, according to what he's saying here. Eliphaz and Reuel. Then he says, in verse 11, and the sons of Eliphaz were Timnan, Omar, Zippo, Gatam, and Canaz. So legitimately, Eliphaz had five sons. But then he says, now Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek. Can you see that? So they were cousins, they were related. So, Esau was the grandfather of Amalek. Amalek being the father of the Amalekites. So, they were cousins. You see, because the truth is the enemy most likely is within than the enemy is outside. And for the children of Israel, the enemy was closer to them. than they could think. Many a times we build walls. We construct walls. For those of us that have come from Africa, you know what I'm talking about. You build a house and then you have these massive walls and you sort of cage yourself in to protect yourself from external attack. Some of us will build walls and we'll put barbed wires around and then we'll say, beware of dogs. Culture is a beautiful thing, you know. You know, because over here, dogs, generally speaking, are pets. But over there, nah. Generally speaking, they are not pets. In fact, some people sadly will starve their dogs at night and make them aggressive. And so we we'll build walls to protect ourselves, forgetting the fact that the enemy is actually inside. And if we do not identify this truth, we may protect ourselves from the outside or external force, but then we are being eaten up from within. So you have some people think that the, the mother-in-law is the problem. 
the colleague at work is the problem. So they try to build walls, whereas the main problem is pride, which is within you. The main problem is anger, which is within you. The main problem is bitterness, which is within. And rather than focusing on these obvious things, traits that we see within, we are trying to fight an external battle. Forgetting that it doesn't matter what is happening on the outside. What we should focus on is what's happening on the inside. So for the children of Israel, without any provocation, they were attacked by their own cousins. And the Bible tells us how they defeated them. And this is what I'm, I'm trying to explain to us. You see, to understand Jehovah Nisi, you need to understand what happened in that situation. How did they defeat the Amalekites? You do not defeat the flesh with the flesh. You read a passage in the Bible, the Bible says, flee, flee. They don't stand and begin to speak in tongues. No. Run away. Because your flesh did not get born again. My flesh did not get born again. I have to subdue my flesh. Great men. I've been brought down because of this. And there's several examples, even in the scriptures. Samson was a great man. He was very strong. But he allowed his flesh and the desires of the flesh. This was a man that conquered cities. He was brought down by the desires of his flesh. So we know they came, Amalek, they came, or he came from the roots of Esau, cousins. Let's go back to Exodus chapter number 17. And so Moses said, this is what we need to do. We're going to divide this into two. I will stay here as an engine room. Joshua, get some strong men, go and fight. But what I do here is what would translate to your experience when you get to the war front. And so the Bible says, let's read on. So verse 10, chapter number 17, the book of Exodus. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of a hill. And so it was. When Moses' hands was up, that Israel prevailed. Please take note of that. You see, whilst they were fighting, there, the Bible says on the hill, Moses was raising, raising up his hand. And I want us to understand that he held himself the rod of God. And he says here, look at what he says in verse 9. He says, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand in the top of a hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now, I hope you remember what the rod of God represents. It used to be called the rod of Moses. Right? But then something happened and it became the rod of God. And he said, I will stand on the hill and I will hold it in my hand. 
And as long as his hands were up, doesn't matter what was happening on the, on the battlefront, they were winning. You see, because the battle against the flesh will not, never be won by the flesh. It takes the spirit to subdue the flesh. And I thank God for the likes of Aaron and her. The Bible says they were with Moses. You, you know, Moses could have said, let, let me go alone. Let, let me do this in alone. This morning we're praying. I said, let us pray for faithful people. A faithful person is not that one that walks away when the going gets tough. Ah, I used to go to that church. I don't anymore. Why? Because they did something to me. Nah. A faithful person sees beyond their emotions. And Moses knew he could not do it, he could not do it alone, so he brought two faithful brothers with him. Because a time will come you would need help. Because the Bible says his hands became heavy. You see, you can't do this thing alone. Christianity is not a life of isolation. It is only foolishness to think you would isolate yourself and beat the devil at his game. He's got experience. He's been here for a long time. There are times when you cannot pray anymore. You feel like praying, but you're weak. But we thank God for the faithful ones that will help us. We thank God for those that will hold our hands, like Moses. He says it. Look at what he says. He says, Verse 11, and it was so when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed and when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. Can you see that? Then he says, but Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You see, we all need, and this is why God created us. I said we are relational beings. We all need that person. We all need that group of people that would help you in your time of need. For Moses and the children of Israel, it was Aaron and Hur. They lifted up their hands. And as long as their hands were up, they were winning the battle. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, let the lifting up of our hands be as of the evening sacrifice, which means in our battle with the flesh. Every time I lift up my hands in sign of worship, every time I put up my hands to God, praying to God, I am directed on what to do to subdue the flesh. You see why the devil tries to stop us from praying and worshipping? I mean, it's even interesting how that some people think that the most important part of the service is the sermon. No. So you see people coming late. Ah, it's almost 11. I would, I would meet the message. No. The Bible says the Father seeks those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. When you preach, when you teach, we teach because of what we've done. So we teach ourselves to stand and walk in the light. When we worship, we worship because of who God is. I 
told us last week. Worship stems from the spirit. True worship. It comes from the spirit. It flows into our soul. And then our words vocalize the expressions, the experience that we're having on the inside. So worship doesn't start from the lips. And the Bible says, as long as his hands were up, they won. Then he says, so verse 13, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. He said, after the victory, I built an altar and he called the name, The Lord is my banner. Now let me explain something. There are two things we need to do. If we really want to experience the victory, Because it's one thing for the Lord to be your banner. But the banner is no good if you live outside the banner. The refuge is no good if you don't come in. The first one we need to do. We need to submit totally. Submit totally. Totally. And the second thing we need to do, I would explain that, is to obey his instructions. You see, because for Moses, because he was submitted to God, he could understand, and because he was obedient, they won the battle. Now, let me explain. Let me just explain something. Let's go to Exodus. Chapter number four. Let me show you something. The reason some of us are still struggling with our flesh day in, day out, and I'm not saying I'm different. Your struggle may not be the same thing as my own struggle. But you see, we have to trust God and submit to him so that he will help us by his spirit. Exodus chapter number four. Are we there? Now, this was the story of Moses when he, he ran away. And at this point, he had encountered the Lord at the the burning bush and God spoke to him as to what he wanted him to do when we say we submit how do we submit a total surrender for you to understand and experience the Lord your banner you need two things submit completely and obey how do we submit look at Moses Chapter number four, the book of Exodus from verse one, he says, Now Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the background to this story was God was sending Moses back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh, the, the most powerful person at that time, to let his people go. And Moses saying, Okay. It's one thing to speak to Pharaoh. It's another thing to convince the people. Just suppose they don't even believe me. What do I do? And some of us are there right now where you are debating on God's instruction because you have doubts. 
Look at what he says. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? If you're using your Bible, please take note of that. Because the question the Lord asked him is the answer he needed. God says, what is in your hands? And the same question God asked him is asking us today. You're saying, Lord, how am I going to do it? What if they don't believe me? I don't think I'm qualified enough. God is saying, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. Now, let, let me explain that Moses had a reason to have a rod in his hand because he was a shepherd. Right? And chances are he picked up that rod on the floor. And for him, the rod was worthless. The rod was only to guide the sheep. But God says, what have you got in your hand? And Moses said, this one is just but a rod. You know, sometimes we don't understand the value of what we have because it's still in our hands. Because the rod in the hands of Moses was worthless. But in the hands of God, it became a snake that swallowed up every other snake. That same rod parted the Red Sea in the hands of God. That same rod brought water out of the rock. But that same rod in the hands of Moses was worthless. When we surrender, when we submit, this is handling that thing which we hold dearly to ourselves, giving it unto God. Because you see, that young lad that Jesus, when Jesus was preaching, that young lad that brought his own lunch. And Jesus said, do we have anything? He said, well, we only got this tiny, tiny lunch from this boy. That same tiny lunch in the hands of Jesus after he gave thanks, fed 5,000 men. Children and women not counted. But in the hands of that boy, it was nothing. Some of us are holding on to things and refusing to release and submit them to God. But as long as we hold on to them, it could be your time. It could be your ideas. It could be your gift. Some of us are gifted by God. And God has gifted you to be a blessing to others. But we said it's only this, nothing but a rod. The Bible says, and he said, cast it to the ground, verse 3. So he cast it to the ground and it became a serpent. Question. Let's just try to relieve the moment. Moses had always had this rod. And maybe he slept with the rod next to his head every day. So God says, cast it to the ground and it became a serpent. How did you think he slept the next day? I'm sure he locked that thing in a cage. Or in the other room. Because I don't trust this thing. We do not know the potential of the things that we are holding on to. Because if only we did, we will let go. When we say Jehovah Nisa, the Lord is my refuge, the Lord is my banner, we need to understand the first way to experience it, to submit. And how did Moses do it? Moses was able to surrender the rod, even though it seemed to be nothing. And the Bible says it became a snake. Look at what happened next. And Moses fled from it. Let me explain something. This morning I was talking about traumas and emotional pain as we're praying. Some of us are going through traumas in our lives. And we may be okay spiritually, 
We will be okay financially. But emotionally, we are not. And for Moses, he had killed somebody some 40 years ago. And he realized that they were looking for him, so he ran away from Egypt. And he thought, you know what, I've escaped. I'm going to live a quiet life. And then God appears to him in a burning bush. And God says, trust trust me, what do you have in your hands? He said, well, it's rod. He drops it, he becomes a snake. Moses, like me, ran away. I know I've always said to people that the only good snake, in my view, is a dead one. Some people will tell you, no, 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 not all snakes are poisonous. I would not wait to find out. I don't want to find out. And for Moses, the thing became a snake. And what did he do? He did the same thing he did 40 years ago. He ran. Because, you see, snakes is a symbol of authority of the Egyptian, Egyptian people. Am I right? In Egypt, snake was the symbol of authority. And what God was doing to Moses, I need to address your trauma. Because you've always been running away from this thing. And you think you've been healed. No, I need to address it. Because that rod could have turned into a lion. And I believe God wanting to help this young man, Moses, made it become a snake. Some of us have made mistakes in the past. And the devil is using it against us. It became a snake. Moses ran away like he did. But the story did not end there. You see, because he had submitted, the story did not end there. Look at what happened next. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Mm. If anybody knows anything about snakes, you know if you want to control a snake, you don't hold it by the snake, the tail. It's the neck or the head area. Am I right? Not the tail. Because if you mistakenly hold it by the tail, the snake will just... Am I right? And bite you. So God is saying to Moses, you've submitted, but I need you to obey me. And to obey God doesn't make any sense. Holding a snake by the tail doesn't make any sense. But God is saying... We are the sons of God, and we walk by faith, not by sight. If you want to experience Jehovah Nisa, the Lord, my refuge, not only am I surrendered, I need to obey. So Moses, the Bible says, grabbed it by the tail, and what happened? It became a rod. You see, because when you obey God, And you let go of that thing you're holding on to. God takes the poisonous aspect of that thing. He takes control of that dangerous aspect of that thing. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's anything at all. Listen, God is able to take that dangerous aspect, unassuming dangerous aspect of that thing if we submit and we surrender that same rod Moses lifted it up and they were winning the battles against the flesh let me show you something first Samuel our time is fast spent quickly first Samuel Chapter number 15. First Samuel, chapter number 15. Our time is fast spent. I want to read from verse 1. Are we there? It says, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. 
Now therefore hear the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on his way when he came out of Egypt. We read that already. So God, remember God said, I would punish him. Now God is saying here, I already said I was going to do it. Now I'm going to do it. And Saul, you'll be the one to do it. And so he told him, you know the story. We, we don't have the time to go through. But you know the story, right? God said to him to utterly destroy. And then Saul thought he knew better. The Bible says he kept the best part and let the king live. Now let's go to 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 1, just because of time. Remember, I said that Amalek represents the flesh. Now, God said, utterly destroy. Don't negotiate. Don't compromise. Saul did not do it. So many years down the line, in verse 1, chapter number 1, book of 2 Samuel, he says, Now it came to pass after the death of Saul. Now something had happened at war. And apparently Saul had been killed. So somebody came to relay the message to David. Look at what he says. When David had returned from the slaughtering of the Amazon, so David actually finished the job. Right? He finished the job. Then he says, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziegler, on the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes turned and dust on his head. So it was... When he came to David, he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did the matter go? Please tell me. Because at this point, David did not know what happened to King Saul. Then he says, and he answered, the people had fled, have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, who obviously was David's friend, his son, are also dead. So David said to the young man, who told him, how do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? Then the young man who had told him said, I happened by chance to be on Mount Gibor. There was Saul leaning on his spear, and indeed the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now, when he looked behind him, he saw me and called me, and, he, and I answered, here I am, and he said to me, who are you? Now, note this. Saul was wounded, according to this man's story. Right? And the people were coming against him. The enemy were coming against him. And Saul saw this young man. And he said, please come near me. And he said, who are you? Look at what the man said. So I answered him, I am an Amalekite. Remember. Note this. Let's read on. He said to me again, please stand over me and kill me for the anguish has come upon me and my but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him. The same people God said to utterly destroy. Because Saul out of disobedience did not destroy. That same people came when he was vulnerable later on in his life, to destroy him. You see, when God says to utterly cut things away, it's for our own good. Saul, the king, when he was most vulnerable, was finished by the same people God said destroy. You see, when we keep alive what God says to kill in our lives, it will come back to hurt us. And it will not come when we are strong. 
it will come when we are most vulnerable. The devil tried it with Jesus. After he fasted for 40 days, the Bible says then he was hungry. And he told him, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And the king lost his life. You know what happened if you read further down? David finished the guy. He said, Who, where have you come from? You're not even afraid to touch the Lord's anointed. But the man did not know any different because he was an Amalekite. You see, if we keep playing with the flesh. No, this is the way I am. Me, I get angry. That's me. No, for me, if you offend me, if I hold you in my heart. Christians, if I hold you in my heart, as though it is something to be proud of. If I hold you down. Carry on. What God says to cut away, and God in my hand is coming back. For some people, I mean, it could be anything at all in our lives. And God tells us, I want you to cut it off. Because you're enjoying it, you hold on to it. Samuel said, obedience is better than sacrifice. The man lost everything. And for Moses, as he lifted up his hand with the rod in his hand, before he experienced Jehovah Nisi, it was a life that was submitted to God and one that lived in obedience to him. And if you want to experience Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my refuge, the Lord, my banner. We have to submit totally to him. And in our submission, we have to obey what he says. You see, Jehovah Nisi was a revelation that Moses had in his day. But Jehovah Nisi is still very much applicable in our lives today. It's interesting to know that, I mean, we don't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore, but it's interesting to understand the, compos, the components, the things inside the Ark of the Covenant. You, you know, remember the Ark of the Covenant? How powerful it was, right? How that it was placed in the most holy place, right? And the high priest would go in once in a year. And if you mess around there, you're dead. Because that was where God's presence was. In the temple. But then God told him to put Three things in the ark. Three things. Can anybody tell me what they were? Yeah? Thank you. There were three things God asked them to put in the ark. As they carried the ark, people are like, hmm, what did she say? It's in your Bible. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Are we there? Hebrews chapter 9. I want to read from verse 4. Are we there? 
It says, okay, let, let's start from verse 1 so we understand. It says, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which has the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which where the golden, now what see, the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Now it's interesting why God told them to put these three things there. Because if you look at the first one, the golden pot that had the manna, that signifies supernatural supply supernatural supply it was God that supplied it reminded them I was the one that fed you you didn't have to work for it but the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want all through the wilderness I fed you number two Aaron's rod that burdened that signified, a, I explained to you what the word was and how it came to be, a surrendered life that leads to authority. A surrendered life. Because Aaron had to leave, give, give up his rod. And the last one, the tablets, with the Ten Commandments, that represents the supremacy of God's word. You see, these three things, put them together. You experience Jehovah Nisi. Because he's the Lord, our refuge. The Lord, a banner. Praise God. I want to encourage you this morning. Don't just mention the name or call the name because it sounds good. Understand the revelation behind the name and let us walk in the light of that revelation. His name is Jehovah Nisi. His banner over us. The Lord my refuge. Let's spend some time to talk to God. Let's talk to God. Let's talk to God. We experience Jehovah Nisi not just when we mention that name, but when we submit ourselves under the authority of the banner and the refuge. I said it does us no good when we live outside of the banner. We have to come in surrendered. And in our surrendering, we obey. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, everlasting Father. Yes, you are Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my refuge, the Lord my banner. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. We submit, we surrender, and we obey, O oh God. Thank you, Father. Make this true for us, we pray, O oh God. That your name alone will be glorified. We give you praise. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Can you ask your neighbor, did you learn something? If everything you to do is watching us online, we'll see you next week. God bless you.